science-based and research-based. But one thing that I learned was how important it was to educate the youth, to get them passionate and involved in science, to then have a broader network of people as time goes on who are also passionate about the environment. And so I've continued my teaching career um, with Audubon Vermont, going from a seasonal educator to Audubon Vermont's first AmeriCorps member. Um, so I served there for a year. And then after that, I got my current position as a teacher naturalist and assistant summer camp director. And I have loved every minute uh, spending with our students and just exposing them to nature and giving them these experiences. Um, I will quickly introduce the youth leadership program and what it means to be an Audubon alum. So we have put together these events um, with the youth conservation leadership program in mind. Um, this program has been generously supported through the Maggie Walker Incentive Fund Grant and Audubon Vermont provides opportunities for next generation of conservation leaders through our structured paid internship programs, um, student-led campus Audubon chapters, and the Vermont Youth Conservation Corps environmental, uh, environmental literacy training module. Um, Alumni Week is aiming to create a space for current and former participants um, in these programs to build up a community that fosters learning and professional development between one another. And we are also excited to invite the public to all of these events to learn about what our youth leadership program is doing and to connect with the Audubon community. Um, so last night we had our first night, which was our kickoff night and it went amazingly. And then tonight we have our network panel with our eight wonderful panelists. Um, so I will have our panelists introduce themselves. They will go off of what I just did and um, we'll run through the night. So the first one that is off is Nathaniel Sharp. All right, hi everyone. I'm really excited to be doing this. Uh, my name is Nathaniel Sharp and I'm currently a data technician and occasional staff biologist at the Vermont Center for Eco Studies, which is located in Norwich, Vermont and does work across the state and um, even in some places outside of the state. Uh, so I grew up outside of Philadelphia, Pennsylvania and um, graduated from UVM back in 2018 with a degree in wildlife biology. And um, I've basically been, been into birds specifically, but also just nature in general ever since I was a little kid. Um, my family used to do a lot of trips down to the Delaware Bay shore. So watching the horseshoe crab migration and the birds associated with that is how I really got interested in the natural world. And um, that propelled me to the you know, University of Vermont where I, um, studied uh, wildlife biology and then did my undergraduate thesis on the dispersal patterns of bobolinks. Um, and that's sort of how I got into um, some of the more fieldwork aspects of ornithology and nature study by working with a project called the Bobolink Odyssey or the Bobolink Project that works with the bobolinks of Shelburne, um, Shelburne Farms in Vermont and a couple of other spots. So that's where I got some banding experience and also um, experience with writing papers and sort of the more um, hands-on aspects of field ornithology. And then from there, I did a position with the Maine Breeding Bird Atlas, where I was doing some bird point count surveys across the state. And then after that, I served for a year with the Vermont Center for Eco Studies as their citizen science outreach um, coordinator with the Eco AmeriCorps. And then that position turned into a full-time position where I am still working now and looking forward to a uh, exciting field season once the uh, once spring comes around. <laughs> Great, thank you so much for sharing, Nathaniel. Um, next up will be Carrie McAllister. Hey everyone, I'm Carrie McAllister. I use she, her pronouns, and I am the program manager at Shelburne Farms in Shelburne, Vermont. Um, and our mission there is to educate for a healthy, just, and sustainable future. And internally, I oversee the education staff and programs, including our school program, summer camp, our children's farmyard, and our intern and post-grad fellows programs. I also work directly with classroom and non-formal educators through professional learning programs, particularly around climate change education. And I work in partnership and collaboration and networks with organizations across the state region and the country. Um, again, mostly those are focused on climate change education, but also some more generally on place-based or environmental education. 
and I am part of the Vermont Education and Environment Network, which is the state level organization for the North American Environmental Education Association. Um, so backing up to my undergrad, I studied environmental studies at UVM um, and I did my master's work at University of Minnesota while teaching concurrently at Wolfridge Environmental Learning Center. And then I taught environmental education and dabbled in some outdoor education, leading wilderness trips in Maine with the Chewankee Foundation. And I moved up to Alaska to work with the US Fish and Wildlife Service, um, providing environmental education, school visits and field trips, and also working with the Student Conservation Association and Youth Conservation Corps there. Then I moved down to California and worked at Nature Bridge in the Bay Area, right across from San Francisco, right across the Golden Gate Bridge. And I started there as an educator and um, moved into program admin and management after several years. And then another thread that's kind of been present through my uh, professional career has been working with international and cross-cultural education programs. So working abroad or with educational partnerships and local organizations in other countries, um, typically around the sustainable development goals and education for sustainability. So thanks for having me. I'm looking forward to getting to know other folks in the room tonight. Thanks. Thank you so much, Carrie, for sharing and being here with us tonight. Um, next up will be Amy Seidel. I'm already really impressed <laughs> and so happy to be a, a, a member tonight. And, and with my fellow UVM alum, I'm sure there'll be many more UVM references. Um, hello, everybody. My name is Amy Seidel, and I use she, her pronouns. Um, coming in from Huntington, Vermont, as others are today, but I'm not at Audubon. I'm in my own house. I live here. Um, a little bit about me, I think, is I grew up in the West. I grew up in Wyoming and Colorado on the high plains near Cheyenne, Wyoming, and in the Rocky Mountains of Colorado. So I find myself being a bi-mountain person, the Green Mountains and the Rocky Mountains, where I spend most of my time. Um, I've lived in Vermont for 25 years. Uh, I came here as a graduate student um, to the University of Vermont and completed my PhD in ecology and evolution with uh, emphasis on plant insect interactions. In particular, I was studying the effect of climate change and actually global change, not just changes to climate, but changes to other atmospheric conditions on high altitude butterflies, some very rare species of butterfly that live in the San Juan Mountains. And my mentor um, happened to have just gotten her first uh, position in academia at the University of Vermont. So I came to be her first graduate student and have been here ever since. Um, as an undergraduate, I studied natural science and poetry. Um, I then uh, took a master's degree in entomology. And as I mentioned, my PhD is in ecology and evolution. And I think that description of sort of my academic genealogy is that I really think of myself as an interdisciplinarian. Even though I'm schooled in ecology and the natural sciences more than any other field, I love thinking across disciplines and I love working with students in that synergistic intersection. Um, I currently am a senior lecturer in the Rubenstein School at UVM and the associate director of the environmental studies program, which oversees the environmental studies major. And we have some alum or people who have been in environmental studies. So here's to that. Um, and I teach courses in environmental studies, in sustainability science, in climate change adaptation and in uh, environmental literature. And environmental literature is a more recent addition to my professional career, but um, uh, about 10 years ago, I wrote a first book of creative nonfiction called Early Spring, which is a story and a memoir of um, what does it mean to steward in an age of warming as an ecologist and as a young mother. Um, I wrote a second book shortly thereafter called Finding Higher Ground, which compares the cultural and biological adaptations taking place to climate change. And this interest in the humanities and in writing continues to be a part of what I do and what I teach. And I'm currently uh, finishing a manuscript in ecofiction. Um, the question was how I got here. And I love how people told us the specifics, but I was gonna say, I got here over time. <laughs> I've been professional now since, um, you know, for 30 years. I got here taking it step by step. Um, one thing led to another. 
The network is so very important. So I'm very happy to be part of this network today. Um, I got here with hard work for sure, um, with the kindness of others and absolutely with my own privilege. Um, I come from a resourced background where I was educated and given all kinds of opportunities as a young person. And uh, I leveraged those ultimately into a successful career, but, but I'm also very, very um, observant and aware of my privilege. And I think in this time, so important to uh, respect and think about that introspectively and to uh, try to bring equity to these resources to all. So thank you very much for having me and I look forward to hearing from others. Thank you so much, Amy. Um, next, Bonnie Acker. Hi there, everybody. I've lived in Burlington for over 35 years. And I think what I really want to give tonight is encouragement to everybody finding their way for wherever you are in life to veer off a comfortable path. Because I think we always can learn from people quite different from ourselves, different ethnic backgrounds, ages, places where people are living. And I've been an illustrator for over 50 years since college civil rights, peace, women's movement, affordable housing, organic farming, all these different movements that I've been interested in, they always have needed leaflets and publications and messages shared with people from a wider community. So that's my heritage is joining groups, seeing that the messages weren't encouraging enough, thinking that I could do some illustrations to help those messages along the way. And right now I'm centering on painting landscapes, which I've done for 40 years, donating half of them to worthy causes, selling others in galleries. Mostly I've never uh, studied formally art techniques. And again, I'm encouraging everyone, if you have any interest in art, try to learn things off the beaten path, not from people who have very set ideas, although some people respond to that. I've always resisted set ideas and gone through my own experiments. So part of the year I paint landscapes, more of what I do is I'm helping on two farms. I've done this for years, Intervale Community Farm here in Burlington, large CSA feeding hundreds of people year round. And also a newer farm, an hour north, Jeffersonville, the Green Mountain Technology and Career Center connected with high school students, conserved by the Vermont Land Trust. So I have these two adventures, 12 hours a day, weeding with a pitchfork. I love both of my lives, being inside doing my paintings, sometimes doing collective art projects with others, and uh, also being outside a lot of the year. Uh, so off the beaten path, and I, I guess my central idea is, if we're not getting across our ideas for solving climate change and other crises, can we pull back and say, how can we reframe our ideas? Not what is wrong with the other person or people, what can we do to change? Because then I think we'll be able to reach more people. <laughs> Great, thank you so much for sharing, Bonnie. And I can definitely tell you that my experience with nature has made me want to connect more with art and vice versa. And so I really acknowledge what you just shared with us. So thank you. Um, next will be Jim Shallow. Thanks, Emily. And uh, good evening, everybody. It's, it's a really a privilege to be here and to be with the, the panelists that we have tonight. It's, it's quite an honor. I am Jim Shallow. I go by he, him. I live in Richmond, Vermont, and I've been in Vermont for 34 years. Uh, I currently work for the Nature Conservancy. We're a global network of people that are working to protect the lands and waters on which all life depends. And currently we are becoming laser focused on the two major global crises facing the, our earth. One is the climate crisis and the other is the loss of biodiversity around the globe. And so we are working to find solutions both at large scale international approaches, but also on the ground and using place uh, projects and places like uh, our resilient connected lands in Vermont to um, 
do conservation on the ground. Uh, we do land protection. We have a freshwater program. Uh, we are the second largest uh, owner of land in Vermont. Um, and we own most of that land primarily to preserve biodiversity. Um, but we also know that people are an important part of the solution to both of those uh, major problems. And uh, that's why I'm so excited to be here tonight, because when I look at my career going back, I grew up in Colorado. I was uh, the son of an Air Force colonel, so we moved around a lot, but eventually settled in Colorado, and I had the privilege to be able to wander the woods and the pine, uh, ponderosa pine forests around the front range of Colorado Springs. And it was in that experience of being out in nature, and then ultimately seeing how much that landscape changed just in the short time that I lived there, um, as a child, I was inspired to want to um, continue to work to find ways to protect the, the, the world around us, the natural world. So I picked up my, uh, my, my goods and belongings and moved to Vermont on a whim uh, because I wanted to spend a winter here <laughs> skiing. And uh, one thing led to another and I met my spouse and we, um, we have lived here uh, since then. My wife, Carol, raised our kids. I've worked... Uh, when I first got to Vermont, I was a teacher at a boarding school. Uh, my background from Colorado College is in history and political science. So I think I'm a little bit of an outlier here uh, with this group. So um, I started working with the Vermont Natural Resources Council, a statewide uh, advocacy group, and because I was interested in policy and um, helping uh, make sure that nature had a voice in our political decisions. And I worked there for about seven years. And along the way, I had the fortune, and I think this is a, a through line throughout my whole career, to have the opportunity to take on a new project for them, which was to start a forest program for them. Having just a love for forests, but not much knowledge in forestry, I just jumped right in. And so I encourage all of you to always take risks. And um, if there's an opportunity and it, and it feels uncomfortable, that may be the just the right one for yeah. you, because pushing that comfort level uh, will force you to be creative and then also uh, bring new energy both to yourself but also to those around you and the, and the issues that we have. So I worked at VNRC for a while and then along came Audubon and they were looking for somebody to open a state program for them and uh, I didn't know much about birds uh, so I applied and they again was fortunate to get that job and uh, quickly learned about birds on the job and so I was um, able to uh, do a lot of on-the-job training and saw how my um, love of birds that I went back to when I was a child was able to connect with forests as well. So I started doing work with Audubon um, to uh, advance regional conservation work focused on forest bird habitat uh, because this area that we live in is so critically important for um, migratory birds. And then after about 20 years at Audubon, an opportunity came along with the Nature Conservancy to uh, become their uh, director of conservation. And uh, I thought it was time to um, take another risk and uh, push my brain and move into a different organization. And I've been there for three years now, and uh, it's been a great experience, although I miss my colleagues at uh, Audubon, which is why when Ray reached out to me to be on this panel, it took me all of about five seconds to respond and say, absolutely. So um, I'm really... Uh, Excited to be here, and I look forward to having the conversations for the rest of the evening with you all about the conservation and any anything that I can share in my um, in the uh, sort of just the, the fortunate position I've been in to be able to be uh, have a job and to a job that can um, is more of a vocation than a uh, than a job. It's really about um, a life's mission. So, thank you. Yeah. Thanks, Jim. We miss you too. So thank you so much for being able to join us. And uh, your comments about risk. I Every day that I'm with my preschoolers, they always make me reconsider my own risk boundaries with them. So it's always, it's always on my mind. Um, next, we'll have Margaret Fowle. Thanks, Emily. Thanks for having me, everyone. Um, I am Margaret Fowl. I use she, her pronouns, and I work with um, Emily and others at Audubon, Vermont. Um, I am a biologist there. I've been there about, I think this now, 11 years, um, maybe 12. Anyway, losing track. A lot of us have been around for a long time. So um, I 
do a lot of different projects. Um, I started out just doing some raptor recovery work with peregrines and eagles, and I'm still doing that work, but I also now do a lot of restoration work, uh, working with landowners to restore habitats for birds, whether it's um, grasslands sh or shrublands. And we're now starting to talk to um, talk with farmers about mm -hmm. doing work to restore habitats on agricultural lands. So I um, have learned a lot of my skills on the job too, just like Jim, and I have a very untraditional background. So I will kind of take, take you through the meandering path that I took to get where I am. Um, so I grew up in New York City, which a lot of people are surprised to hear when they meet me, when they know me, but I grew up in New York City and I always loved wildlife. So I would call the ASPCA if I saw an injured pigeon on the sidewalk. And um, I luckily had <clears throat> grandparents who lived in Northwestern Connecticut. So I was able to visit them every weekend and I would collect snakes for my science teacher and bring them home to bring to my science class because no one else in the class was ever going anywhere where we could collect snakes. So, um, so I always had this sort of affiliation for wildlife. Um, I went to college and I also had a real affiliation for art. And so that's what I ended up studying in college. I was an art major. Um, I took a lot of biology classes, but I ended up getting my degree in art. And after graduating, realized that that wasn't really gonna lead me where I wanted to go. So I floated around for a while. I went out West and supported my ski habit. Um, I really just, became obsessed with the wildlife out west and then I ended up getting an internship back in Vermont at VINS a um, long time ago where I worked in the raptor rehabilitation center so I didn't know anything about hawks or owls but I was able to get this internship and it ended up turning into a full-time position um, taking care of the injured birds there and um then after a little while, a few years, I realized that I wasn't that happy being around injured wildlife. That I wanted to be working with wildlife in the wild where they were healthy and hopefully working to prevent some of those injuries. So I applied to graduate school and I got into the UVM, um, which was back then was called the School of Natural Resources, now the Rubenstein School, um, as a non-matriculated student. So my advisor, Dave Capen, who's now retired, kind of took me under his wing and said, if you can take these introductory classes, um, like statistics and calculus and uh, some other basic ecology classes, then we'll let you continue. So I did that, found a thesis project, which was working with cormorants on Lake Champlain, which at the time were exploding, um, and uh, got my master's degree, and then ended up going back to VINS to work on their peregrine recovery project just as a seasonal person, um, found an internship at the National Wildlife Federation in between, like two sort of seasonal positions. Um, and uh, then National Wildlife Federation realized, oh, we should be, maybe we should be doing some wildlife work in Vermont. This was an office in Montpelier. Um, they were doing mostly policy work at the time. And so kind of got lucky in that I was in the right place at the right time where they wanted to take on the peregrines and then stayed there for 10 to 11 years and then they dropped the peregrine project and Audubon took it on and so I kind of moved with the peregrine project and ended up where I am now. So um, I feel like in a lot of ways I was at the right place at the right time and in a lot of ways I was also just willing to um, kind of put myself out there and be this non-traditional student um, to um, take some risks, just like others have said on the panel. So um, that's kind of my story and happy to answer questions when we're in smaller groups, but just wanna say that it's awesome to see all of you and some of you I know, some of you I don't, and some of you I work with and have worked with, and um, it's just great to, to have such an impressive group here. Thanks. Thanks so much, Margaret. Uh, next will be Bridget Butler. Hi, everyone. Uh, thanks, you guys, for having me tonight. It's really great to be here and see a lot of new faces and some, well, I shouldn't say old faces. Oh, I don't know. Oh, 
We'll just skip that part. I am Bridget Butler. I am also known as the Bird Diva. I own my own small business called Bird Diva Consulting, which specializes in outreach um, and programming around birds and bird conservation. Um, I didn't like birds to begin with. I really liked seaweed. And I grew up in central New York, which is hard to like ocean stuff and seaweed and dolphins and things like that when you live there. Um, but I also liked being outside all the time. And I was one of those latchkey kids that got off the bus and immediately like ditched the book bag and grabbed the bike or whatever and went into the woods. So Margaret, I know the thing with the putting the snakes and the worms and the stuff in the pockets, right? Like my mom hated that coming home. Um, I came from a hunting and fishing family. So um, I have a lot of that running through um, my blood and, and the way that I look at the land as well. Um, and I did finally get to follow that, that urge to be connected with the ocean. Um, my grandmother lived on Cape Cod and she really encouraged me to explore and so when I got the chance to go to school, I applied to University of New Hampshire and studied marine and freshwater biology there. So I have a bachelor's in science from, from UNH. Um, after I left school, I kind of bounced around to a bunch of different Audubon centers. I worked with kids mostly um, in uh, summer camps like Emily, right? That's how we get started and we get our foot in the door a lot of times. Um, and then, uh, so I worked at the Seacoast Science Center um, just outside of Durham. And then later I went and worked with Massachusetts Audubon at the gorgeous Wellfleet Bay Wildlife Sanctuary out on Cape Cod. So um, I got to be with my grandmother and do what I love so much. And there I started running um, kids programs and was the day camp director for a number of years. And that was when I was in my 20s and things got really serious, really fast. And I freaked out because I was being asked to be on all these different boards. And I was like, who am I to be on their science committee for your school? And so I was like, I got to get out of here. And this is crazy because I didn't know this about Jim or Margaret. This whole skier thread is really interesting. <laughs> so I decided to ditch it all. And I was told that Vermont, JP, got the most snow in the Northeast. And so I was like, that's where I'm going. And I'm going to be a ski bum. So I was a ski bum for a number of years and went to New Zealand and taught skiing. But always on the side, I was doing nature stuff. I would lead snowshoe treks at night for clients at JP and teach them about the natural history there. Um, funny story about that. If you join me in the breakout room, I'll tell you a really good story from there. Um, but I really missed connecting with people. And that's when I discovered Audubon Vermont. Um, I really wanted to get back into environmental ed and I joined the staff there. Gosh, I think it was in, I don't know, the nineties sometime. And I got to work with Jim and I came on there as um, an education staff person and became a naturalist and then got to work on the forest bird initiative that Jim talked about. And I think that was really huge for me to shift from working with kids to working with adults where like you were really seeing conservation in action. And that jazzed me a lot. You guys were talking about taking risks. Some of the rest of you, I think the biggest risk I ever took was to say goodbye to that job and go work for Maine Audubon off the coast of Maine at Hog Island for a year as their program director. Um, unfortunately, that program was going through a number of upheavals and I had to then take the next risk to walk away from that. And I came home to Vermont and didn't have a job. Uh, did a little bit of acting on the side and uh, then ended up working for Echo Lake Aquarium and Science Center. Just whoosh, go this way. But it was that conservation thread um, that tied back in. Um, another another piece that I think I'm known for that um, was another thing that I think is important in terms of taking risks and following, like, what are you good at and what are the weird things that you're good at? And I'm good at talking in front of the camera. And 
every time there would be an interview and someone would say, well, we need to talk to so-and-so about something. Most of my colleagues would be like, yeah, no, I don't want to do that. And so, and I'd be like, I'll do it. I'll do that. That's fine with me. And it got me gigs working with channel three and channel five and um, led to 11 years on Vermont edition and just like all kinds of crazy stuff. I had a podcast before there were podcasts. Um, so yeah, I think, right. Follow, follow things that are like your bliss. Cause those ski things, when you go on these offshoots, like Bonnie was saying too, right? Like this path that goes in another direction. Where's this going to take me? It might take you someplace like really super amazing. And uh, the other amazing thing that happened to me was having three kids shifted my work, um, how I focused on conservation and connecting with nature. Um, it led to my slow birding signature program right now. And it led to me having a small business, which allows me a lot of time and flexibility and still keeps me connected with a lot of the faces in this place, in this little room right here, right now. So thanks for having me, you guys. Thank you so much, Bridget, for sharing. And just from hearing all of our panelists, you know, I'm getting the message that there is no straight and narrow path of our journey in life. And even with nature too, there's so many different paths and connections that we can make with science and community and conservation. And so I just know that these breakout rooms are going to be thriving with energy and I cannot wait to start them. So um, on that note, uh, our breakout rooms will be made um, so that there will be at least two panelists in a room. Um, they will be randomly assigned to the participants in this meeting. Um, so you will get to enjoy 30 minutes with two panelists. Um, it's very informal. The space is for you, the participants, to be able to ask questions, share your story, hear more about the panelists' story as well, um, and just try and learn more about like different paths in conservation and science and um, here in Vermont and here in other places as well. I'm really interested in what Bridget's story is that she gave us a little sneak <laughs> taste to. Um, so Debbie will be uh, putting us in those. She will also be giving us time warnings too on the screen. And then there will be that final like 60 seconds where it like counts down. Please stay in your room as long as you want to as well. You know, you can just take it to that last second and then it brings you back. Um, so please take this time, enjoy the conversation. And um, if you have, uh, sorry, if you have questions for a different panelist that you might not be in their breakout room, there will be time when we come back that you can put those questions in the chat and um, I'll read them to the individual panelists as well. So we will have time for that, but I hope everyone enjoys. And if you have any issues or technical things, you can like, I, like hit like a question mark or like an alert thing. And I think Debbie will be alerted and she can pop in and help out with any issues. So enjoy these 30 minutes. Thank you. Hello. Hi. I'm joining you, Amy. Yeah, thank you, Ray. I appreciate that. Yeah, my pleasure. Introducing yourself a little bit. Hello, everyone. I'm so sorry. I I'm late uh, today. I, I just lost completely the timeline due to the time difference between Brazil and the United States. And it's so good to see, look, we have Chavelli here. We have Emily, oh my gosh, I can't believe it. Oh, uh, Emily, uh, and, and all the bomb folks, we have Margaret and also, of course, Ray. Kiara, it's so nice to meet you. And well, uh, let me tell you guys a little bit about my background. I'm so honored and humbled to be here with you guys today. Uh, basically, uh, I am an international environmental attorney. Uh, I got my uh, law degree at the Vermont Law School in 2017. And then uh, I started 
moving the needle towards gaining international background towards my career. So I had the chance to work for the Center of International Environmental Law in Washington, DC. Basically the word involved uh, law policy in the fields of climate change, uh, environmental law, and also some ag and food uh, inclusions. But as a matter of fact, I also had the chance to work uh, with uh, different organizations in Vermont, such as the Vermont River Conservancy in Montpelier. Uh, and also, of course, uh, the, the Audubon, which I had a wonderful time there with all the staff where I could learn. Uh, well, oh my gosh, it was such a, a very wonderful period of my life. Uh, and then afterward, I worked for a, a small land trust in, in Vermont, the Jericho Underhill Land Trust in Jericho, Vermont. Right now, uh, I'm back in Brazil, just waiting the borders to open to actually embark in my PhD journey in Australia, where I actually already started my degree online, unfortunately, because it was supposed to, I gained a very generous, generous scholarship to be there. Uh, but I can go to Australia since the borders are still closed. Right now, I'm working here in Brazil as a global consor consultant for the Governor's Climate and Forest Task Force, uh, which we're doing work towards the Brazilian Amazon in such different fields of climate, environmental conservation, environmental stewardship, uh, and also in the policy arena across advising the governors on how they can actually get different perspectives in using uh, different experiences uh, of different jurisdictions in a worldwide scale to help them implement better legislation in Amazon. Uh, and you guys know, uh, unfortunately, Brazil right now is a hot spot for COVID, but also it's a hot spot for this for deforestation. And I would say that uh, the biggest environmental challenges uh, right now rely on Brazil and most likely in the Amazon region. And it goes from deforestation to poverty and also climate change and also land degradation. And one specific thing that really delved my studies into is illegal logging. Uh, and within my PhD dissertation, I'm working in the intersection uh, of technology, law, policy, and of course, how we can further advance international environmental law towards using tracing technology to help the conservation of the species and also to tackle the most appealing environment, international environmental law issues uh, worldwide. It's not an easy task, uh, but I know with the contributions from you, well, I can get there at some point. So I'm not here to actually teach you guys anything. I'm just here to listen and to learn. And I just would like to say thank you again at the bond for giving me the opportunity of being here and learning with this such prestigious audience. Thank you. Thank you so much, Marcelo, for being able to join with us tonight. Um, so I just wanna open up the space for us to uh, have any questions that you have for other panelists that you maybe didn't um, get a breakout room with, or if you have any other questions for the panelists that you were in a breakout room with, please enter them in the chat. Um, and I will read them out as they come in. Um, so I'll give some space for that to happen. Sounds like you all have, oh, Liz, great. Um, would it be possible to get contact information from all of our panelists? Um, I would say that would be up to the discretion of the panelists. Um, if they would like to, uh, you panelists can put their uh, information or say yes to that in the chat and then maybe um, we can send out an email to those who did join us and the panelists who wouldn't mind us sharing their contact information, we can send out an email with all of that. So if the panelists wanna say yes, they're good. Jim's already put it in, great. Thanks, Nathaniel. Oh, 
Wonderful. All right, and then um, Shavelli asks, uh, she would love to hear about um, learning, more about learning on the job and time management. So I feel like this could be a question for any of the panelists. So if anyone has a good answer for that, uh, you can raise your hand and I'll call on you if you would like. No one's good with time management. <laughs> Jim. <laughs> well, I guess I can't stand awkward silences. I, <laughs> I, as everybody on the Audubon staff would know, I can't speak to time management. Um, but <clears throat> I, I will say that about learning on the job is, you know, I think bringing sort of fundamentals in, into your work of, you know, being able to communicate well, write well, um, a willingness to, you know, dig into research and, you know, study stuff, you know, just read everything that's coming along. And then I, you know, what I found throughout my career when I was in roles where I was learning on a steep learning curve was to find a mentor who, who will be there for you to answer questions or, you know, point you in the right direction. For me, it, you know, when I came to Audubon, Warren King was that person for me. He was like, took me out in the field and showed me how to, you know, what, which birds are what and how to identify them. And then also, you know, help me navigate the, uh, the intricacies of Audubon internal politics, which is a whole another level of, of um, uh, social science. Uh, and the same is true when I was at BNRC, I had a mentor who was actually at UVM, uh, Dr. Carl Rydell is um, no longer with us now, but he was, a, he was a great mentor, even though he, you know, he was on the board of BNRC. So I would say in any of those five, you know, when you're in that situation, find a mentor or find folks that are also doing similar work, you know, and, and, and build those networks within your organization um, and, and learn from each other. Because learning doesn't always have to come down from on high, right? Um, learning is about um, communication back and forth among peers as well. So that's my thought. And then on time management, when you get the answer, let me know. That's all I have to say. <laughs> Great, thanks for sharing. Bridget, did I see your hand raised before? Yeah, you can go. <laughs> okay, just, just go. Um, okay, so time management, things that I've learned. I told our group that um, right now I am a pandemic homeschooling mom that's trying to run a small business and uh, yeah, and, and I don't even know how I do it most days, but I carve out time and I prioritize things. I use a lot of post-it notes. They're like everywhere. If, if I could shift my camera around and when I really start to freak out, I like pick the things. These are the things that are most important for me to get done right now. And then I've learned to be very specific with people when they're like, well, we'd really like you to do this. And uh, don't you think this is a great idea? Like, tell me what you want and when it needs to be done by. So don't be afraid to ask somebody and say, you need to give me a deadline for that because otherwise I can't fit it into all these other little things that I'm trying to do. So definitely ask for a deadline. Um, the bullet journal method has worked for me hugely. If you don't know what that is, take a look at it online. You just Google bullet journaling. And it's literally since becoming a mom and a business owner um, and in a way also head of household, I can literally, I've learned a method to keep a notebook. It's not, it's total analog. It's not with my Google calendar and all some kind of software stuff, um, it doesn't work. I write it down and it, it, it's just a really great solid method um, that's worked for me. And I fall out of it sometimes and that's okay. You'll find your way back into it. Um, so those are the things that I can say about time management. Jim, I don't know if that helps you at all. Um, and there's days that it crashes and burns and it's all right that it crashes and burns. In our little breakout group, group we were also talking about failure and being like, yeah, that didn't work. And I'm all right with this. And these are the things that I learned from it. We need to talk about those things more. Um, what was the other part of the question? Something about 
uh, on the job learning. Oh my gosh. Say yes to everything. I mean, within reason, right? Like don't put yourself like way too far out there. But I think when I started, I mean, the best example I have of that is, is TV and radio. When I started saying yes to that, it just snowballed into so many other things that I never even imagined possible. Um, I mean, I made, I made small eight minute movies when I was at Echo that are still out there being used now. And I was the, the writer, the director, the producer, and the, the host. I mean, it, it's just kind of, I can say that loud and I was like, that's just strange. So say yes to things and try new things. The other thing that Margaret and I talked about with our group is grant writing, grant writing, like build some skills around that. I didn't have it at first. And, um, I got in my, in a small nonprofit, um, group, um, got a job with a, a small local nonprofit and that became a huge part of my job. And so learned a lot really quick. Thanks Jim, by the way. <laughs> Thanks. I, called Jim up. I was like, Oh my God, what do I do? And Jim was one of my mentors. So there you go. Wonderful. Thanks so much for sharing, Bridget. Um, we have another question come in. Um, that is, how has your understanding of your field or birding conservation changed since transitioning away from school? Um, has it narrowed, has it become more specific, or has it broadened? Um, and if you could be specific with this, that would be great. Margaret. Uh, I'll take a stab, Liza. Hi. Um, she lives down the road from me. So <laughs> here we are in our Zoom world. Um, I So my experience with school, I'm thinking of grad school here because my undergrad was totally different. But um, was my experience with school was that it was very narrow and that my job now is very broad. So um, I learned some skills in school that I use now and I can apply to what I do now, I, you know, do now, like in terms of using GIS or writing skills or collecting data. Um, but I use them for, you know, I, in my grad school, I worked on one species. It was one project um, other than the courses I took. Um, it was very narrow compared to what I do now. And I feel like what I learned there were great skills, but they weren't, uh, but they were only skills that I applied to other things. They weren't skills that I actually took with me necessarily. Um, like my, my knowledge, sorry about dogs. Uh, my knowledge of cormorants doesn't really have anything to do with what I do now at Audubon. Um, it was more about my ability to um, observe them and study them that, and um, write about them that applies to what I do now. Hopefully that answers some of your question, Liza. Totally. Yeah. Thanks, Margaret. Hi. <laughs> Thanks, Margaret. Um, would any of the other panelists like to share anything along with that question? Yeah, I'll just, I'll jump in on that. Um, hi, Liza. We're sort of in a triangle, Margaret, Liza, and I here in Huntington. <laughs> um, you know, when I when I started out as a young field biologist, and I so it was so exciting to hear all the ways in which we all were young field biologists, so pretty much, or young naturalist educators. Um, it was about sort of gaining skills and understanding the components and constituents of the forest or the of the tidal pool or, or whatever ecosystem we were in. And not that I've ever left school, right, because I continue to live in that academic world. Um, those experiences are almost crystalline for me now because um, they're, they're sort of the staff of life, right, to have gotten the time to be immersed in observation and phenology and in data collection and to have field books where we were just noting patterns and processes in the world um, is, a, is a beautiful sort of cultivation of biophilia, right? Of our love for nature and, and the love for life. And so as I go on and I, you know, sit in a lot of committee meetings or I, you know, do other kinds of things to organize um, students in environmental studies in a university, I reflect on that time of 
um, the concentrated time of observation? So it's a great question, but for me, it's now when I look at birds, uh, you know, I don't think of them so much as data. I, I think of them as just this gift, right? Um, so it certainly has broadened and it's certainly the backbone of my feeling and my, my passion for, for stewardship and what I do with my professional life, yeah. Well, if I can say something, I would say that uh, the great part about being in events like this is that we always speak the same language. And when we can always speak the same language, it's so pleasant to be here. But I would say that something that actually I'm thinking these days in terms of uh, trying to better, there's a, a the question, since transitioning away from school, I would say that when it comes to nature and everything that it's involved towards its preservation, conservation, and uh, all its beauty, we're going to be forever at the school. And don't you dare to think that actually uh, one is gonna have the solution for the environment. That's exactly the other way around. The environment has the solution for us. And we are the ones who should listen to that and try to use our skill to point out uh, the, you know, the, the, the answers that there's no, there's no magic formula. It depends on where you are, but there are some baselines, some guidelines that you can actually apply that science can help us in that regard. So uh, these days, I have a sense that the more I try to understand nature itself, the more ignorant I feel. Because once we're living this crazy times in terms of climate change, environmental destruction, and all these catastrophes we're living these days, uh, we have to try to understand and think where are we going to, where are we heading to, and how can we use our skills to help that. The future of mankind definitely is going to rely on how we're going to be able to provide quick solutions for those issues. But uh, I understand that it's a growing process, but it's a growing process that requires our urgent attention and try to learn with nature what the message nature is trying to address for us. Uh, and it's hard. And so the more I try to understand that, the more ignorant I feel. And I hope that at some point I can actually help more in terms of providing intelligent answers. Great, thank you so much for sharing, Marcelo. Um, we have one final question from Tessa and it's a great wrap up question too. Um, so does anyone want to share if they have any particular passions or projects that are going on that they are particularly excited about? Um, and if there's any aspects of their current job that they're really enjoying currently, we would love to hear about them. No one's Wait. doing anything fun. <laughs> I've, I've, got, I've, I've got a project I'm working on that I'm, I'm going to rope in Bridget a little bit and also Emily in a way as well, um, where <laughs> um, something that I've been, that's sort of the definition of a passion project because it's, um, well, first of all, a, pro a project that Bridget and I are really passionate about. And also it's a passion project in the way of, we don't have any funding for it. We probably spend a lot more time on it than we should, but it's just a really fun thing to be working on. And it's um, this project we have called Bird or Broker. And that's essentially what we're doing is we're pairing up experienced birders with landowners who want to know what birds are on their forested properties. So we're finding a birder who um, has a lot of experience with Vermont birds and identifying them and encouraging them to go visit this landowner's property, go for a walk with them. The landowner can show them what their um, forest is like, what, their, what the habitats are like on their property. And the birder can say, oh, that bird that you hear singing all the time, that's an oven bird, that's a hermit thrush. Um, there's scarlet tanagers nesting on your property, and here's why that's really neat. And it's just a project that combines two things I'm really passionate about, and that's looking at birds and also connecting people with nature. And on a sort of a larger scale, connecting people that look at birds with people that love nature and sort of starting those relationships and building that community around people who want to preserve the birds that they have on their property and people who want to go out and explore and spread the love of birding to people that have an interest in it but don't have the experience or the tools to sort of, um, if they, maybe they don't have a field guide or maybe they don't have a friend who's knowledgeable about birds they can text pictures to, but this sort of starts those connections and 
introduces a landowner to a birder for ideally um, enhanced conservation on that property and sort of an enhanced interest in the bird life that they are sort of um, providing a home to. So that's been a project that I'm really passionate about. I'm excited to get out with my landowner partner and walk around the forest of Belvedere this summer. That sounds amazing. Um, very great use of resources. Um, does any of our other panelists have a project they wanna share? If not, we'll wrap up. All right, we'll wrap up then. Um, well, I just wanna give a huge thank you to all of our amazing panelists and for all the participants as well. Um, this event could not happen without you. So thank you um, for, for sharing your words and your experiences and um, creating this wonderfully safe space to all connect with each other. Um, if you want to put in the chat, we have just a final wrap up question where we can just share um, what did you gain from this experience? So if there's one thing that stood out from your breakout room that you want to put in there, um, or if you just have a final thought that you would like to share, we would love to hear from you. Um, while you do that, I will say that tomorrow we have another event that is happening. It is trivia night. Um, so you can still register for that and it's going to be so much fun. And then our final night is Thursday and there is going to be a webinar, um, called changing the story of birding. And it's going to be a wonderful panel with some really great panelists there. Um, but again, I just want to thank everyone. Uh, Ray has put the links in for those events. Um, and if there's anything final that anyone wants to share, put it in the chat. Um, but this was a wonderful evening. I had a lot of fun moderating for us all. Um, and so I hope that we enjoy what is left of our Tuesday. But thank you all. Bye, Audubonners. Bye, Jim. <laughs>